and WECS Willimantic. All right, it's uh, that time of the show where we're going to talk with someone famous and wonderful. And today we have none other than Dar Williams. How are you, Dar? Good, how are you? Great, thank you. You've got a new album out, In the Time of Gods. Uh, we've already played uh, I Am the One Who Will Remember Everything, and it's, uh, it's doing very well. Uh, I was doing some research and I noticed on your music uh, when I prepared for this interview, you have a bunch of hit. You don't have a bunch of hits on the top of the Billboard charts, but you seem to be one of the staples in mu- in the music industry, who has longevity, is respected by her peers, and has a loyal, sustaining fan base. Is, is that an accurate assessment? Yes, that's that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. And um, I've I've been doing this for a while. I, started in the early 90s and I've played a few of your songs um, so you definitely have longevity what do you think contributes to that the most it was the intention from the start and it was very much what we built it was this idea that you know I had a kind of a phobia about going up and down the the flagpole and I knew that's not the kind of song I could write anyway so um, you know if I tried to fit myself into the mold of doing something that you know really gets out there in the pop world for the purpose of kind of going big early. Um, I knew that I couldn't survive emotionally, mm-hmm. <laughs> as well as it just not being something that it was, you know, what I did. I mean, you know, it's, I believe in that we have muses, you know, and I, I had a muse, and it was for stuff that was more lyric-driven. And, of course, I was in Cambridge and Western Massachusetts, which were places where, you know, that was that was a really well-respected to take, and I had peers to criticize and to encourage. And so, um, you know, so, so the kinds of songs I was written were sort of planted in the right soil to, to begin exactly the career I really I really wanted. Um, you know, those were the heroes of my parents, and you're always trying to please your parents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think that, that fits. You, um, you mentioned that you, uh, you've been in... New England area for a while. You attended Wesleyan in Middletown, correct? Correct, yep, yep. And you've lived in Northampton, my favorite getaway. Uh, any st- stories that you can share with us uh, on your connection to New England? Uh, well, first of all, I love the Willimantic co-op, the food co-op. It's yes. really good. <laughs> um, and uh, Middletown, you know, if it, uh, somebody, they let us know pretty early on that apparently back in the day, um, if uh, somebody said, I'm just going to send you off to Middletown, that meant that you were crazy because <laughs> there were uh, all sorts of different kinds of hospitals meant, uh, for, for mental uh, disorders and, uh, you know, problems. And so, um, and those were around. And then there was a joke that, that, you know, Wesleyan was really seen as no different at a certain point. And, you know, it was, it was known as for having um, like a... a uh, you know, a, an LSD lab in the 60s in one of the basements of the fraternity, so it kind of had oh, that nice. reputation. But it was actually just, um, it, it was kind of uh, stabilizing by the time I was there. It was pretty pretty funky still, but um, it was uh, kind of stabilizing. And now, I'm sure people have seen, you know, there's just a lot going on in Middletown. I mean, it's a really cool town to go to. So... Um, and, and there were people from Wesleyan and Middletown who kind of found each other to, you know, really work on Main Street to make it a lot more cool without cool being a buzzword for gentrified and kicking everybody out. So um, it's, uh, like, I really think it's a it's a great, great town. And um, so, yeah. and I, you know, so I did my, I was a theater, I was a pasty, skinny, dressed in black little, theater major, and then I moved up to Northampton uh, after going to Cambridge for a while, and that was that was a lot of fun for, for about a decade. It, uh, you're right about Middletown. It's really kind of grown, not anything big, but it has its own like little niche now. It's a nice place to hang out for a day. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, you know, it's got, it's got this feeling, it's this thing that I kind of study in towns when I go to visit them, you know, in terms of how how they feel to, to an outsider coming in. And um, it, it, Middletown, you know, feels good. It, it's got a lot of cool restaurants, and, it, and, it's, and you feel like 
you know, it's a town where people know each other, and it doesn't have, like, the massive town gown problems that y- you can have, and we had some, you know, when I was there. So, you know, you get a sense that the Wesleyan kids come off the hill and do cool stuff, and, and that Wesleyan doesn't seem like this sort of an unapproachable, weird place yeah. <laughs> anymore. we got a great children's museum, a children's center, and, and um, so, you know, that's, I don't know, it's, it's a... Uh, like it's right in the middle of of uh, kit, kit, and I think it really, um, you know, it's it's a good, it's it's a good heart for for Connecticut. Yeah. You, now you've had an opportunity to play with on stage with many great artists, such as uh, Ani and the Indigo Girls, Joan Baez, the Neils. Uh, is there anyone you would like to team up next with next? Oh gosh, no! I mean that I just decided that that's a really dangerous game. <laughs> like, <laughs> just setting yourself up for you never know. You, you know, might get what you ask for, right? Disappointment or just like a really awkward moment if I actually meet that person and it's been like at one point there was one uh, I was so so into Moby's album Play and somebody asked me that question and I and I said Oh Moby's album Play and then I started working with people who work with Moby and I <laughs> I always wanted to finish every sentence like and of course. I don't think Moby has to work with me. <laughs> I'm happy. I do what I do, you know. And so um, I'm a, no, you know, I, I really, it, it's extremely fun. I mean, like any line of work, you know, when you meet someone who kind of is, does what you do, but in a different genre, you have different stories. And um, that's, you know, when I meet up with blues folks or like one time I was doing a gig with, and Parliament was on the bill, and they were, like, all over the dressing room, and one guy put on this loincloth, and his friends were taking pictures of him, and <laughs> they were, like, <laughs> they, like, they'd found some costume, and they were putting it on. Or actually, when I was with Joan's band, Joan Baez's band, they, like, we were, uh, you know, they, they they had been in bands a long time, so they knew how to do the kind of the raucous band thing, and we were in this room that said, that had all of these wigs, it was uh, for for the theater department, and it said, "Do not touch the wigs." And everybody in the band were like, "Okay, which ones are we going to try on?" And like Joan was trying on wigs, and the bass player was trying on another wig. We found me, and so there's this kind of, you know, it, with you know people who've been at it for a while are really fun to meet. People who are just starting out, it's really fun to like act like an old old hand, um, and it's always just fun to make music together. It it, it musicians are kind of have hearts that are reaching out to, to, to learn more. Mm-hmm. In your in your new album, In the Time of Gods, um, I heard that it was inspired by Greek mythology. Is that true? Yes, yes. What, what are, um, are all the songs related to that theme, or just maybe a couple? Yeah, more or less. I mean, I cheated when I needed to because I didn't want it to sound like a, like a term paper instead of an album. Like, I wasn't... I think if you say, I, I did a concept album, then everyone's going to say, you know, well, did you succeed at the concept? And I didn't, that didn't really matter. You know, I didn't want to get an A on my paper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I, mean, I really wanted to write songs that, that I was feeling, but I was feeling that kind of, like there's, there's a kind of a, <clears throat> I think that in the United States, which is kind of an adolescent country, you know, like we're kind of a young country, you can look at everything as, you know, the sky is falling and, and, this is a really serious time, and it's kind of end times, and if you put it in the scope more of, you know, a few thousand years, um, it's uh, it's a lot more interesting, and a lot, and I think a lot more accurate, you know, like we're always going through something, you know, people have lived through the rise and fall of their own cities, like literally cities being raised to the ground, and, and so... Um, the Greek gods are very funny because they stand for civilization throughout, you know, throughout the rubble and the and the wars. You know, they say you must stand up for justice and education and beauty and, um, you know, the arts. And at the same time, in, in Greek mythology, they're the ones who cause all the chaos. They're the ones who cause cities to fall down or wars to happen because two goddesses are, you know, competing with each other and then that's the beginning of the Trojan War. <laughs> so it's like, like and, and by the way, you should deal with chaos. I mean, we created it, of course, but, you know, we still believe in, in civilization. So, um, and that kind of reminded me of, of humans, you know, like we are really trying to stand for civilization despite, you know, our, our best efforts to sabotage ourselves at times through our own, you know, 
need for love and attention and and stuff and that's just that lens is very understandable to me as opposed to you know you're wrong we're doomed you know these people are good these people are bad so it was it was and it's much better for a songwriter to not kind of be pointing fingers but instead be kind of looking at the larger human condition which the gods for some reason really capture the human condition that's really interesting. I, I'm I'm one who really kind of listens to the rhythm and the beat of a of a song, not so much the lyrics. But now that you're explaining it to like that, and now I'm going to definitely pay more attention when I listen to your album. My thank you. That's really cool. <laughs> um, and a while back in an interview with AmericanSongwriters uh, dot com, you were asked for a song of yours that has touched many people, and you replied, "After all," which is about your return from clinical depression. Out of all the people who contact you and say that your lyrics have meaning to them, do most of them interpret their lyrics the way you intended? Um, yes. Actually, yes. I mean, and that's the that's the cool thing about certain songs. You know, it's, um, you know, when you have something in common, uh, when you have something going on that's kind of complicated and you're writing about it, if you write about it like, and I define it as A, B, C, that's kind of boring, but poetry kind of just pulls out aspects of it that make it identifiable, you know, like A and C. And so if somebody else has been through it, they'll see those, you know, markers, and they'll say, oh, yeah, I went through it too, and, and it's a, it's a, you know, a, it's just a medical sheet if you're just talking about it, sort of what it is, the, the facts and figures of it. But if you're describing it poetically, you know, you sort of put out these this kind of breadcrumb path. And and um, that song in particular was probably the most open to being completely misinterpreted. And yet people would come and comment on specific parts of it. Um, you know, like I say, the winter uh, depression is like a winter machine. It feels like a winter machine and you go through the winter machine and you catch your breath and then you and then you go through it again. You know, mm -hmm. you have very little time between sort of depression, depressive times. And everybody else seems like they're just going on their way and heading towards the spring. And like, you know, they go through bad times, but they recover. People really specifically related to that and, and really specifically described their own version of that, that that made me feel like it had been uncanny the way they had related to it. And then pe there are some people, like my husband doesn't, he never had this thing going on. So like, it just kind of tunes out when I sing it. it doesn't really resonate with him. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how, how how you can get a connection with uh, people through music, and it's so powerful. Yeah, it's, well, and it can be like a little a secret language, you know, yeah. and that's nice. Mm. Now you're going to be playing. You were last night in in Connecticut, right, in Norfolk at the Infinity mm -hmm. Hall. Uh, uh, no, last night I was in uh, Fairfield. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong day. <laughs> no worries. Fairfield, that's right. Uh, <laughs> And tonight you're in Portland, Maine. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, next weekend you're going to be at the Infinity Hall in Norfolk, uh, Connecticut on the 7th. Yes. Yep. That's an 8 o'clock show in um, Norfolk. That's out by New York border, right? I believe. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's uh, over by the yeah, northwest corner of Connecticut. Hmm. And then a couple of days after that you're going to be at the Bryn Mawr Gazebo. Mm -hmm. I was reading something about uh, they kind of adopted your song "As Cool as I Am" as uh, their kind of a theme song. Well, Bryn Mawr College did. They have this thing in early May called the May Hole Dance, the May Hole Festival, and they took "As Cool as I Am" as one of their theme songs. Yeah, I've been, you know, big honor. That's cool. So I suppose you're going to be playing that uh, a couple days late into June, but <laughs> you'll be playing that yeah. for them in a couple days. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That, that was one of my favorites when I was uh, doing the show back in the 90s. Now, I ask this question of everybody, and um, as an artist who's performing across the country, you probably get out a lot, and is there any place that you kind of look forward to going to to get your favorite comfort food, whether it's ice cream or a burger or a favorite pizza or something? Yeah, I I love um, Milwaukee. There's a... There's a um, place called Altera Coffee that has, um, that, that has, uh, they're just, every, they have like five different ones in Milwaukee and they're all cool and it's all, it's run by these two brothers, um, who, uh, have, 
the, um, you know, everything is, they, they roast it there, and you see the big roasters in the main mm-hmm. headquarters. And, you know, they do stuff where you actually see one of the, the cafes is an old pump house, so you actually see the, the pumping, the pump house machinery, and it's all kind of behind plexiglass, and they label it, and they talk about it. So, you know, you're, you know how coffee makes you all, like, make sort of, Big associations, anyway. Mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> then you're you're looking out at the lake, you know, um, and you're on uh, Lake Michigan, and you're uh, thinking about the past, and you're thinking about this great city, and 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 um, it's there's nothing like it. It's it's my favorite favorite haunt in the United States. That's cool. That's really cool. Uh, I was just out in Ames, Iowa, and um, at a coffee house uh, just a little cafe it was called the vinyl cafe it was kind of cool they had good cappuccino yeah nothing but... beats a good cafe i, I encourage every city that i i really started to pick up i'm actually going to start writing either an article or maybe something longer uh, sort of talking about what i see and what i think would really help these great towns that are already starting to kind of find their juju one of them is just get some cool cafe culture People will talk to each other, and they'll hang out together, and, you know, they'll have that place. It's so important to have, you know, good coffee and tea and, and, and a place to talk to people so that, you know, otherwise people just make assumptions about each other. Mm-hmm. We need to communicate more, basically. Xenophobic, yeah, exactly. So, um, and, and if you have a waterfront, I always say, you know, just do something there. Yeah. Love to, to get to the water, and, um, you know, for so many decades... I see a lot of detritus along waterfronts of where people, you know, treated it like a business place, which it is. But the people who have out on the water, even using like a lot of that old stuff as the bone, the cast, it's like, it's, it's very groovy. You know, everybody loves that. So it's like, I always dig into their history and dig, beauty and don't just use it as their I think I'm starting to lose you Dar um, want to thank you for uh, calling us and spending some time here on the show uh, you've got a wonderful album out in the time of gods and you'll be in the area again next weekend on the 7th in Norfolk at the Infinity Hall thanks for joining That's us right. uh, uh, thank you no problem stay on the line please all right, Dar Williams right here at WECS. All right, we're going to play uh, a song off her new album, and this is I Am the One Who Will Remember Everything. <laughs> <laughs> 